sir i think there was some uh, miscommunication can you hear me sir yeah you know something uh, i think the connection dropped or something so yes 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 i, I welcome dr selvaraj sir our uh, state president of uh, asi chairman of asi thank you hello, thank sir. you hello hello sir thank you thank you thank you for joining sir i think you can continue sir hari krishna uh, i just have to re if someone has to yeah, re enable screen we are share. making that we are making that sir we are making that co host i welcome dr bos uh, <laughs> senior uh, uh, surgical oncologist hello sir hello everybody fine hello sir uh are the screens back now yes sir, it's visible sir are visible okay yeah thank you very much uh, for joining thank you sir uh, i was just about to say that uh, we have a large uh, multidisciplinary team uh, on a weekly basis we discuss around 50 patients 50 colorectal cancer patients there be around 30 30 to 35 uh, colorectal cancers that be around 10 15 sometimes 20 uh, metastatic colorectal cancers so the liver surgeons will be there as well um and there'll be a, on an average around five anal cancers and anywhere between two to five early rectal cancers so this is our weekly workload so each each of this cancer has to be presented with the basic data set which i've just discussed with you and then we'll make a decision every unit have their own decision making process and uh, it is variable so bradford has a different protocol leads as a different protocol shafield as a different protocol hull as a different protocol even in yorkshire so i don't for a moment want to uh, enforce that this is the way we are doing it is the only way it has to be done but it is one of the ways we have we have latched on and done for the last 10 15 years and we found it reasonably safe and successful so what are the ways of treating it uh, um, i'm sure a lot of uh, experienced gastroenterologists in the meeting they'll be able to do an emr and uh, uh, endoscopic submucosal dissection for some of these cancers it is technically challenging because uh, many of them the low middle and low ones have to be done with retroflexion uh, there are some recent platform changes which helps to um, facilitate complete excision uh but in my opinion it is submucosal dissection so not full thickness but full thickness can be attempted in the posterior plane uh, especially in the lower lower third of the rectum then we have the gamut of transanal surgery the traditional pox transanal resection of rectal tumor what we call tart even now uh, every week we have one or two tarts on our theta list the thames and teo they are the same procedure with two different platforms uh, the tamis is the new kid on the block the last last 10 years it's been popularized cheaper more flexible easier to access but there are some limitations and there are some hybrid platforms like taser taser is a combination of esd emo and uh, tamis and rats it's a ro- robotically assisted uh, transanal surgery so the robotic intuitive transanal platform is uh, in in testing in some of the major centers in the world i'm not sure whether it's been tested in india uh, but it's it's a, it's is a completely different robot itself to the one which we use for colorectal cancer so you can't turn the robot around and use it transanally the platform it's the, the robot build itself is different of course we can do radical surgery for all the patients with rectal cancer early or advanced the ones who are not fit for surgery or who don't want surgery there have been a handful of patients who don't want surgery want to say just give me some an alternative 
and chose to have contact radiotherapy. We have two centers in the north of England who do contact radiotherapy. There's one in Hull, and for several decades, the one in Liverpool, uh, in Clatterbridge, have been offering contact radiotherapy. And ir irrespective of whatever modality of treatment they have, the crucial bit is follow-up, because as you can see, the number of trials and everything, and all the large series is without the follow-up, there is a chance that the benefit of minimally invasive surgery is lost for some patients. Ideally, what we want to remove is, a, is if we have an early rectal cancer or a large polyp, we just want to remove it with on block with a good margin, like what's there on the right side. Unfortunately, it's not the case, and especially for endoscopic uh, resections, we do get it piecemeal. So uh, which one is better? Obviously, the full thickness on block excision is better for most of the cases, but sometimes it's not possible in which case we may have to accept the, the piecemeal excision types. So let's start off uh, quickly with uh, the tran transanal approach. This is suitable for anything up to five centimeters from the verge, very easy for posterior lesions. If, they, if it's an anterior lesion, you may have to put them in prone jackknife or any of the lateral positions. Uh, uh, any transanal retractor can be used, but we have a Pox anal retractor simple diatomy, or if you want a full thickness excision, we can even use a harmonic scalpel or any of the newer uh, energy sources. The aim is to get a good margin and be very careful about the anterior lesions because it's so low that we can cause collateral damage. There are some limitations to transanal excision. So it is just not possible to remove a, 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 as easy as it seems. So uh, some, sometimes because of the build of the patient to get in and get the exposure to give an R0 resection can be very challenging. And the, the higher the lesion goes from the anal verge, the more challenging it gets. The next is the Thames and TEO. Way, way back in 93, it was described in Germany. It was a, it, it was a uh, water irrigation based system which was a very rigid metallic four centimeter diameter proctoscope uh, inserted into the anal canal after, dilated, after an anal dilator uh, is used. It has its own light source, irrigation system, suction channels. The first system was manufactured by Wolf. There are several of my colleagues in the country who still use the newer version of the Wolf uh, Thames water irrigation system. We use the TEO system, which I'll describe in a bit. Uh, it gives a, a reasonably good uh, degree of view, 180 to 210. The, one of the crucial uh, things to note is that it is beveled proctoscope. You can only look top down so if you have a posterior relation and the patient's in, in Lloyd Davis, then you can, you, you can insert the proctoscope and then you view it from top down. If it's an anterior lesion, you, do, you cannot rotate the proctoscope 180 degrees and look from down below. It's very difficult to do it and complication prone. So the patient has to turn prone, jackknife, or at least lateral to access the lesion. So I just went through Buse's uh, original article in uh, 1980s, and I thought that was a really good outcome. 380 cases, 4% for 4 chance recurrence and 10% complications. We'd be struggling to reproduce that. I'm not quite sure about the, the data validation, but uh, on the face of it, it is quite impressive. So this is the temp skate. This is what the, this is the, I'm sure there are Thames kits uh, in, in Trichy and in various parts of the country. The, the only limitation is it's beveled, can only do a posterior in the, in, in the, in the lower half. So if, if the lesion is anterior, I don't know whether you can see my mouse uh, arrow, if the lesion is anterior, the patient has to turn prone very freely to set up especially the, the, the last time I've used Thames, what Thames was in Norwich in 2009. Mouse is visible, so, sir. Sorry? The, mouse is, the mouse is visible. 
Oh, thank you. So the lot of pipes, tubes, trapping going, water irrigation going in, the other suction channels going out, takes around 20 minutes to set up. If one thing is leaking, you know, the floor is wet and you are, your, your trouser is wet as well. So um, it is a fiddly instrument to use, but uh, there are some surgeons like my colleagues in Bradford who watch, colleagues in Birmingham who watch, will only use this kit because they're used to it. Uh, this is a Thames kit which we use. Uh, it, there is no water irrigation in this. It is air insufflation, the Stotts uh, insufflator. Uh, use quite high pressures, 25 uh, millimeters. Um, the rest of the kit is dependent on the uh, generation of instrument that you have. If you have the latest Thames kit, it'll be 4K. The one which we have is only normal resolution because it's around 10 years old, but still working. Uh, it has some ridge, there's some uh, um, port placements, port uh, access points there. It is, the frame is screwed to the table. If it's done properly, this takes around 10, 15 minutes to set up as well, but it's very rigid platform to go and work on the, uh, on, on the polyp, which is sometimes required, especially when it's very large. This is a graphical description of uh, what, what we attempt to do. We mark the tumor or the polyp, full thickness excision. So the yellow fat, this is the mesorectal fat uh, all, all around. And then and any energy source can be used. You can use your diatomy scissors. You can use a uh, diatomy hook. You can use harmonic scalpel, make sure or uh, the buoyant or any any available energy source for hemostasis, it has, but usually at full thickness. And then suture the uh, defect back. We try our best to suture it transversely, usually top down or lower down up. If we minimize the uh, angle of the transverse scar, this will reduce the chance of postoperative stricture formation especially if the, if the defect is more than 50% of the circumference. Can't be un underestimated, especially if you see uh, the, the, the middle rectal fold there. The last patient which I did uh, two weeks back, that was a T1 tumor post-op. We got the results last week, but it was a huge tumor. The reason you ask why on earth we're doing this go do a TME, but she was not fit for a TME because of multiple sclerosis and various other comorbidity, but wanted the tumor out. All the risks were given. So once I removed it from this area, the defect was from uh, say three o'clock to 11 o'clock, straggling the middle rectal fold. The middle rectal fold was out in the bucket in the way the specimen. So the defect was quite large. So uh, for safety reasons, I did laparoscope. Uh, there was no contamination or, or perforation, but because the defect was so large, I did a diverting loop colostomy with a view to do a contrast study uh, in about six weeks and close the colostomy once the healing has been uh, occurred. You can take the chance and leave it with a large defect partially closed but uh, there is a higher chance of uh, pelvic contamination. So this is another example of how, how it looks. Uh, this is intramuscular in certain areas and full thickness in certain areas. So between Thames and T, your personal preference or what you're used to, if you can, if you can uh, uh, do the procedure with one or the other, you can stick with this, there's no problem. So just a quick rundown of uh, the advantages or the comparison between transanal excision and TEMS procedure. Uh, in this kind of systematic review, 55 case series were, were studied and analyzed. Uh, obviously, because of the, of the stability of the platform, the negative margins were more in, in, the, in the TEMS group. Uh, complete on-block specimens were more in the TEMS group. 
and local recurrence was less. So obviously, based on uh, the advantages of technology and access uh, and skill over simple transcendental accession, uh, the, the, the TEMS platform offers great advantage. So this is another uh, systematic review and meta-analysis uh, uh, published more recently. Again, the post-op complications were similar, but the specimens, margins, and local recurrence was less. Higher and higher the polyp is from the anal verge, more chance of perforation. So it's not rocket science. The higher it goes, the rectum is grows out of its uh, mesorectal envelope, especially the peritoneal reflection. And then, if you do, uh, if you attempt a full thickness excision in for an anterior middle rectal tumor, you will perforate the, uh, the rectum. So one one has to one has to uh, guard caution while choosing the procedure. For example, in this study, uh, 480 cases, uh, 13 were cancers, the rest were benign lesions, 5%, uh, 6% perforation rate, reasonable conversions, no mortality. The, it is just, just to say that the more difficult the, the, the operation, longer the operating time. Uh, and obviously more complicated the procedure, longer the hospital stay. So overall, if the lesion is, is uh, if it's more than seven centimeters, higher chance of peritoneal perforation. So one has to keep this in mind while consenting the patient, because in the way uh, uh, I'm sure it is in your practice as well, and in, uh, in, in, in the current practice, Everything has to be told very explicitly and, and recorded. Uh, and if we, find, if we have a complication, there are certain recent uh, obligations which we have to do, like a duty of candor meeting and a duty of candor letter, saying that, uh, men mentioning explicitly that a complication has occurred for your operation, although it is expected, uh, the, the, in your case, which has given you this amount of extra operating uh, time and this amount of extra ho hospital stay. One of the main issues with uh, TEMS is the size of the proctoscope, operating proctoscope. It's four centimeters in diameter. And if one holds it and looks at it, it's quite astounding. How or not we're going to get this in into the anal sphincter? There is a greater dilation mechanism to get it in. So the next question is, is it going to affect the sphincter function, which we are trying to preserve? So in one of the study, uh, it does affect rectal uh, anal sphincter function. There is a drop in the pressures and the function, uh, but it slowly recovers over six to 12 months. So we have to mention this in the consenting process as well, because the urgency, uh, incontinence or leakage of liquid stool and uh, the need to wear a pad and get back to the normal working environment all has to be factored in. Overall resumption of normal pressures over a year is reflected in the uh, quality of life scores, which have been measured and found to be normal. So this is a comparison slide between TEMS and a radical resection. So what are the, well, what's the actual advantage of uh, uh, the radical resection or TEMS one over the other for T1, T2 tumors? If it's T3, TEMS is, a, is, 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 uh, is, a, is not the first line treatment unless they are not fit. Like the patient I did uh, two weeks back, so if the patient's T1 or T2, we may be over-treating them with a radical resection. Can we preserve the organ? Can we preserve the sphincter? Can we preserve the function of the organ? So that is the kind of the, uh, the bottom line. But another important aspect is cancer clearance. So we can't compromise the cancer clearance 
while preserving the organ. That is why there are four or five trial, trials going on uh, in across the world to find out what is the relationship between function and cancer clearance. So overall, from this uh, systematic review and meta-analysis, we can see that uh, the, um, the local recurrence and overall recurrence are similar, uh, as are the distant metastasis and, and, and the mortality. Uh, obviously, TEMS has a shorter operating time, length of stay, and reduced complications. Uh, I'm not quite sure how many in the audience, the uh, gastroenterology team or the surgeons do endoscopic submucosal dissection. I cannot, I can see the audience in one of the views, but I'm not sure it's if the, if the cham, chap person can take a straw poll and uh, let me know. Is any, anyone do, re, uh, you can see one, one um, ESD. Anyone do EMR and ESD? Ari, uh, we do in our hospital EMR and ESD for the okay. uh, like cancers. Okay. So uh, the, 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 uh, in this comparative series, we can see that the uh, very, very similar um, on block resection rate or zero resection is slightly lower in uh, the endoscopic technique, complications same recurrence rate was higher in TEM. So the, the authors discussed that this could be due to them choosing more advanced tumors and more uh, diff tumors placed in more difficult locations to do it uh, at, on the TEMS platform could be the reason for the higher recurrence rate. And the uh, post-treatment completion uh, rectal resection rate was higher in ESD. So I think there's a, there's a, there, there is another later series from Oxford published last month, which have com uh, compared ESD, uh, TEMS and radical resection. And in that series, 500 pay, uh, cases, I didn't have the time to put them as a slide, the Oxford, the Chris Cunningham series, they basically said that uh, they are the same. So if you choose the right person, so the, 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 there is heterogeneity in the data. So when there's heterogeneity in data, what I mean by heterogeneity is the patient chosen for the ESD, slightly different to the patient chosen for the TEMS. But if you choose the right patient, the outcomes are similar. So, what we don't know is if we choose the a difficult patient we do times with and try to do an ESD on them, what will be the outcome? Obviously, because of ethical reasons, that kind of trial or a study can't be done. So the summary of the slide and the discussion is that if the expertise is there, if the lesion is appropriate and the patient is willing, you can do an endoscopic resection uh, and produce a similar result to TEMS. So what do you do if you get a recurrence after TEMS? You restage and assess the patient, check whether there's local regional or distant metastasis. You can redo the TEMS uh, and uh, remove a deeper layer of the mesorectum along with the skull. And this may well be a therapeutic measure if the patient's having marginal fitness. Obviously, if there's a, if there's a young patient and if there is a, um, uh, if there's, if there's a recurrence of cancer, the gold standard is an anterior resection or an AP or depending on the, or, 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 or the height of the lesion. There are many centers uh, again, there is a lot of variation practice. So give preoperative uh, radiotherapy in the UK. Some of our trials, like the Star, Star Trek uh, phase three trial, which is going on at the moment, is trying the same radiotherapy component, short course and long course. And there are some centers who try contact radiotherapy for the recurrence, depending on the patient preference and their fitness to undergo a major resection. So there are a lot of options if there's recurrence of the TEMS. One of the, one of the questions we are commonly asked when we concern the patient with TEMS is, 
what will you do if it comes back? So we, we just have a, 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 a kind of succinct answer to give them that several options and we will explore it. Hopefully it won't be necessary. Obviously chemotherapy is for distant metastasis. So I'm just going to go through some complication of 10. So it's fortunately it has a, a low operative mortality, less than 1% and uh, low incidence of major complication, rectal wound dehiscence, bleeding, rectal pain, abscess fistula, rectovaginal fistula and stricture. Very common to have minor complications urinary retention, mucus discharge, minor bleeding, some requiring readmission, retake, uh, and uh, stopping the bleeding in theta or endoscopically. And ob obviously the functional outcomes which you've seen before. I'm going to skip that slide uh, to kind of uh, give time for discussion at the end. So, what, one of the things which you touch is the heterogeneity of the treatment which we give for early rectal cancer, even in the practice in the UK. In Sheffield, we do not use radiotherapy for early rectal cancer. It is surgical excision, either by uh, transanal excision or uh, TEO. If there is a margin positivity, this is R1, if it's R2, then there's no question they need completion resection, anterior resection on APER. If there's R1, then we can go re-excise and follow up with uh, an endoscopic surveillance. If uh, the patient's not willing to accept the risk, they'll obviously have to undergo the anterior resection. The reason why I'm telling this is there are some units like our neighboring unit in Bradford do give short course radiotherapy. And their publication, which again came in 2021, uh, suggests that they have reasonable experience uh, in uh, organ preservation and sphincter preservation by giving short course radiotherapy followed by TEMS for T1, T2 tumors. The uh, duration of follow up is, I think, average five years. I think it's quite good. Five years is a quite good follow up. Uh, we haven't adopted the technique of giving radiotherapy before TEMS in our unit yet, but we might change. At the moment, because of our, I only have unvalidated data. I'll speak about that later. In our data, this, the, 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 the need for radiotherapy hasn't risen. So one may argue that maybe you're over treating the patient by giving short course radiotherapy for all T1, T2 tumors. Several trials are going on. Some are closed, some are still open. Star Trek is still open. Uh, Tesla is still open. Greca 2 is still open. So there, it's still, uh, uh, Trek is closed. So the, the, the question being answered by the trials is can we add any kind of neoadjuvant therapy along with TEMS to preserve the organ better while studying the toxicity levels and the quality of life. So I'm going to rapidly move on to TAMIS. So TAMIS is a very flexible, low cost platform. So uh, it is, it is a, I'll show you the picture. The, the, the one, the one on this side is, is, is a TAMIS port which you use regularly. I use a similar a variation for this for the single port laparoscopic colectomies and anti-resections. It's a slightly bigger version. It looks very similar. Same company manufactured it. It's very platform. This goes into the anal canal. This is outside. You stick your ports in and you can do it. You can see the two sizes for the uh, anal channel. So we use the same laparoscopic instruments. Uh, the, it is similar laparoscopic skills, although it's not lateral choreography, it's parallel choreography. So you have to move and work like this in the parallel way. So if you're, do using, if you're doing single incision 
laparoscopic procedures, the, there is a kind of uh, a transferability of skills between TAMIS and single incision laparoscopic surgery. So there are two platforms approved. One is gel point applied medical, which we use, and the SILS, traditional SILS metronic port, which I think is now out of the market. Uh, I have used this, but it's extremely difficult to maneuver within this. This is much better. Anyone uses the TAMIS platform in the audience? Okay. So the comparison between the two uh, lower profile, thank you, uh, as opposed to rigid platform, quicker to set up, longer to set up, flexible, it's quite rigid, fixed setup in, in, the, in, the, in the TEO. The ease of movement, you can move in all directions, especially northwards, sidewards, lateral. The, the TEO can be only done in one quadrant and it's posterior. You can use any insufflator as long as it's, uh, it's vetted and validated. There are a lot of other problems as well. Tamis, because it's flexible, there's a lot of billowing unless the patient's completely paralyzed depends on the anesthetist, there's a lot more fogging, uh, the views are less uh, or suboptimal, if, if I can use that. Uh, it's, it's, it's reasonably good for low and mid, mid rectal lesions. It can't be used for very low lesions because the, 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 kind of the proctoscope platform comes and covers it. So if the, if the lesion is very low, you can't dock the TAMIS platform properly. The, the gold standard obviously is, is, is the TEMS TEO platform, which is much more stable. And for the middle and upper rectal lesions, there is no beating the TEO platform. Uh, it, the, the, the kind of the disadvantage of the TEMS is brought up in the middle and upper lesions. And this is the comparison. So this is the TEMS platform in which the long proctoscope is inserted. It's quite rigid. And when you're working from that far, the range of movement is limited to one small quadrant here. Because this is sure short five centimeter platform and you can move the ports around easily and you can actually rotate the uh, platform on the, on the, uh, the patient uh, as, as, as it is docked. So you can move around and, 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 and deal with it. It's a very good platform to start learning doing transanal surgery. And if you want to do single incision laparoscopic work, uh, nothing to beat the, the gel point platform. So overall, there are a lot of transferable skills and can be used. We, we started doing TATME in Sheffield, stopped doing it because of the complication rate, not with us, but elsewhere reported. And there's a national moratorium on, uh, as in several countries in Europe in, in doing TATME. I think it's a good technique, but it's, it's, the quality control was overlooked and therefore the procedure is gone to disrepute. It might come back, we have to wait and see. So comparison between TEMS and uh, TAMIS, I'm rushing a bit here because there are a lot of slides and the worst thing to do is uh, give a long talk before dinner. So I know you've been, have had a long day uh, uh, and it's, 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 uh, it's uh, terrible to sit there with a hungry stomach and listen to someone chat about uh, transanal surgery. So overall, very comparison. The, the comparison is extremely reasonable and acceptable, easy to set up. And if you can do it, you can try it. So one, one of the things which I want to again quickly go through is when you look at a lesion, what are the, do you have any predictors uh, by looking at it or the pathology of the lesion, which can, which can suggest the chance of recurrence or residual disease. Obviously on block to full thickness uh, and uh, piecemeal, on block is better. And the resection margin. So if the resection margin is more than two millimeters, it's low risk. If it's more than one millimeter, the risk is higher. And if it's less than one meter, we take it as R1. That is our definition for R1. So in one of the uh, cases we did in the last three weeks was a patient with a BMI of 40. 
So he's 124 kilograms. So compared to a surgeon like me, he'd be some twice my weight. Uh, and he had a low rectal lesion. He didn't want major surgery. It's going even on the robot, it's be very challenging. Uh, it, it, it was, the EUS reported as T1. MRI reported as T1. We did a transanal excision. It is less than one millimeter margin, full thickness. There's, there's just fat posteriorly. It is one of the things it will happen if you do, if you keep doing that many cases, it will happen. And the uh, exit policy for him is an abdominal perineal section, which he'll be booked for sometime in April. The polyp size, the bigger the polyp size, higher the chance of the polyp having cancer in it, although it is not sampled in the biopsy site. So if I see a poly, if I see a patient with a three centimeter polyp showing high grade dysplasia on the biopsy, not cancer, they, they, we, we, we may tell them there's a 50% chance that uh, they'll have cancer in the polyp system. So if it's more than 35 millimeter, 75% chance of uh, cancer in the specimen. Uh, as it was alluded uh, uh, by a chairperson when he spoke, rectums have a high chance of cancer in them, the rectal polyps. A bigger rectal polyp, more chance of cancer. Uh, Kudo pit pattern, um, this is increasingly being used by gastroenterologists now and even surgeons to I to identify the chance of it turning into cancer, the pit pattern is three and more, very high chance of residual cancer, cancer in the specimen. So we should treat it like one. Venous invasion, deeper the invasion, more chance of cancer. Lymphovascular invasion, as uh, cross-tabbed with the size of the lesion, more the depth of lymphovascular invasion, bigger the polyp, more chance of cancer. So as you can see, there are there is a kind of the multiple areas, multiple parameters one looks at and decides that although it is histologically a benign lesion in the pre-op staging, more than likely to be cancer in the final pathology, so treat it like one. The ACPGB have a risk stratification method which predicts based on the criteria what would be the chance of the polyp or the lesion having cancer in it. And if it has cancer, recurrence in it. I'm not going to do the detail, it's all online. You can go and read. So basically, if you have a patient, what comes in practice, is the take home message is, the theory is one side of thing. So if you, tomorrow you see a patient with a three centimeter polyp in the middle of the rectum, what are we going to do with that patient? What are we going to tell the patient and how are we going to work it up? So the workup, as you know, from our unit, what we do, we assess the lesion, assess the patient, the fitness, comorbidity, their preference, what they want and what you would recommend. And based on the expertise in the unit. So if the, 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 the reason why 30% of the patient, of our patients are referred in to the early rectal cancer MDT is referred in because they don't have Indirect ultrasound scan or TEMS or other transanal techniques to deal with in their, in their unit, or the patient prefers to have uh, such a, a procedure and therefore refer to our unit. So, speak to the patient. Our prime ministers traditionally like to go to the hospital and take pictures of talking to the patient. So, if they can do it, why not we? And we, 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 we explicitly, explicitly tell the patient about this pre-operative staging, uh, especially the younger ones, uh, because they, 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 they Google the years out and come with uh, information which is very difficult to undo. Don't try to fit your expertise to the patient. Sometimes they don't match. If you think that it's, uh, it needs to go to a different unit, send it so that the, the patient gets the best treatment instead of trying to jam the patient into what you can do. So if you, for example, if you see a lesion like this in the middle of the rectum, what are the options we can do? So if, if the biopsy is benign, 
we are not going to biopsy the bottom. We don't biopsy the base. That's, that, is the, that is the principles of endoscopic uh, practice. We have to biopsy the top. And it, it can be a sampling error. If it comes back as benign, again, go back to the principles. The bigger the polyp, uh, more advanced the pit pattern. And uh, depending on what the staging is, stratify into the possibility of benign and T1 and deal with it. TEM stamis, EMR, ESD is equally possible. Depending on the availability of expertise, it can be done. Obviously, if it goes into this category, there's only one way we can do clearance, anterior resection with or without radiotherapy. If the patient's not fit or doesn't want radical surgery or minimally invasive surgery, surprisingly, there are some patients who don't want a surgical option. They can go for contact radiotherapy. The recurrence rate, I'm just going through the details uh, while I was waiting for the meeting, the current published literature, contact radiotherapy, uh, primary response rate is 40%. So we need to tell them that there is a more than 50% chance that uh, the, 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 the cancer will recur. This is unvalidated data. The, 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 the the notation of the unvalidated data is because it has to go through two assessors to check the data and ratify and cross-check whether all what is recorded in the database is correct. And it doesn't have data from some of the tertiary referral uh, units. So over 100 patients, so it will be around 140 when we take the tertiary referral units as well. So it's not the complete picture. Males are more quite high BMI, uh, all, more, all of them had an MRI scan. We have not had uh, uh, any patient as such who not had an MRI scan. Most of them had endorectal. Uh, pathology is, 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 is overwhelmingly TVA benigns. There have been some 30% uh, chance of having cancers. There are a few neuroendocrine tumors and previous car accessions. R1 positivity, around 10%. A small number of perforations and strictures and bleeds. Average operating time, three quarter an hour to one hour. Length of stay, usually one, one night. Handful of them have had uh, completion procedures and redo temps. It's been one mortality. Couple of recurrences. This is unvalidated. We need to go back to the, because when they refer patients from tertiary sites, uh, sometimes they're followed up in the local site. So we may go back and check that that number may vary. And there's been uh, two, uh, two, two of these recurrences have anti-resections after a year. So the summary of the message is uh, there are, it, it is a, although it's an early rectal cancer, it is a complex scenario to stage and uh, get involved in the decision-making process. There are several modalities to treat them, which means that there is not one particular modality which is 100% effective. So we can have a range of them in our unit or as our skill, and we have to balance the patient's requirements to our skill set to offer them the best possible treatment option. Thank you. Hari, that was a wonderful, elaborate uh, lecture on transanal surgery. And uh, there's a good uh, audience now at the end of the lecture. Before we uh, go to the other questions, since uh, Dr. J.C. Bose is also here uh, online, I would request uh, Dr. J.C. Bose uh, comments before we get on to the audience in the hall today. Hello. That was a very nice talk, uh, Dr. Hari. Thank and you very much. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, very clear in your expression of what should be done and what should not should be done. Now, I have some queries on your talk. Like one thing is, uh, how do you really assess the distance from the anal verge? Because this has been always a problem for us. So whether we believe the MRI or the scopy or what is your take on it? How would you really assess 
the lower limit of the lesion from the anal verge. Yeah. So if the, uh, the lesion is visible on MRI scan, uh, we, I just, we just put the sagittal picture into view and then do a straight line from top of the anal canal and the anal verge. So the, the size of the sphincter is so variable. You've been a female patient, male patient, the size, some have BMI of 25, some have BMI of 45. So it is so different. So, so that's, that's one modality. So there's more than one modality to assess. The least, the least uh, valid measurements is flexible endoscopic measurement. We find that it's always wrong because it's not the endoscopy or the endoscopist. It's because of the, fun the flexibility of the endoscope. Invariably, it gives, overestimates the kind of the height of the tumor. So the second thing is when they when we see them in the patient in the in the clinic, by that time they've already had the anal canals prodded some 14 times. Despite that, we 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 there are two of our surgeons. We we do our own rectal examination and rigid sigmoscopy to assess to get a get a hang of where is the lesion. The main thing is we were able to get it out to be able to position the patient on the table. So that is because we have seen anterior lesion referred from a neighboring hospital being posterior or vice versa. So it is uh, self-examination in the clinic uh, with, a, with a digital rectal examination and rigid, proctor, uh, rigid sigmoscope and MRI. If the lesion is not visible on MRI, there are some lesions which are not visible on MRI scan, then uh, sometimes I repeat the flexible sigmoscopy myself, uh, not necessarily on the table uh, or in, a, in, in the endoscopy list preoperatively. Right. But how do you practically measure it? Like, for example, you put the scope in, like, uh, how, where do you keep your fingers and how do you really measure it? Do you use a scale or what do you do that? Like for, uh, with a, with, while doing a rigid sigmoscopy, for example. Yes. Yeah, so it is a, I mean, my simple thing is uh, put the scope at the lower end of the lesion. Okay. Obviously, the scope, because it's rigid sigmoscope, it'll be straight. Okay. And then finger at the anal verge. Right. Take it out and look at it up in the air. Okay. So, and then that will that'll give the, obviously, like I'm sure you're using the disposable uh, rigid sigmoscopes, the okay. self-eliminating ones. So they do have the markings there. And uh, the, the, it gives a good because the, the the lubricant will be right at the verge. So we put the lubricant there. Okay. It usually corresponds to the finger, finger, where the finger is. Right. But that's a good tip, right? See, uh, this has always been a problem because you know when two surgeons see one person says that it's at five centimeters, the other guy says that it's at seven, right? So because there's a lot of problem when we assess a lesion which is anterior and posterior. Do you see any difference in that? Uh, not diametrically opposite, but the 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 lateral lesions and especially we 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 speak in the clock phase, so twelve, three, six, nine, and whatever. So what what sometimes is confusing is when the endoscopist tells us as clock phase what they have referred to as twelve. So the patient may be supine or in the, in the left lateral position when they're doing the endoscope. So they might think that uh, the, the actual, when the left lateral, when they're the left lateral, the 12 o'clock is on, on the, or facing the wall, not the ceiling. So it is, it is at the anatomical 12 o'clock rather than the 12 o'clock on the, on the wall clock. So that's when the confusion comes. So that rotation is, translated in the report. So when we repeat the assessment, it is opposite. Okay. So you use almost all the modalities and finally come to a conclusion. And when there is a disparity, you prefer the rigid scope. Yeah, I prefer the rigid scope. So okay. I think uh, if, 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 I, if, we, if we repeat the assessment ourselves, okay. then there's no one to blame or there's no excuse. 
And uh, why are you against chemo radiation as a primary treatment? So we're not against chemo radiation. So we do. We, it's just our unit has a, a protocol for giving chemo radiation as a group. So our TME and TME RO resection rates are quite high. So based on that, even for midrectal tumors, N1 within the mesorectal envelope, we can provide a, a reasonably high level of uh, R0 resection. Okay. Not reasonably, but quite a high level of R0. Sometimes there is a node sitting on the circumferential resection margin. So that is, according to the pathologist, an R1 resection. If a node, although you have done a TME, if there is a node which is sitting on, you can't go wider than the TME in the pelvis. Even a lateral pelvic node dissection is non-anatomical. It does, it's not on block, you see? Right. You have to do the TME, and then you have to go back and take, take the operator nodes out. I think it's very, very complicated procedure to do it on block. Uh, uh, and a very, very it's high chance. It's not of, possible, yeah, I agree. But it's not possible. Right. So we, we, we are offering ourselves to that. So it, it is not we are against it. It is just that the, the, the practice has been set that if it's within the mesorectal envelope, uh, even the lymph nodes, we offer them a TME. Obviously, if it's N2 and higher, if it's uh, nodes are closer to the CRM, we do offer around 20% around of the patients have long course chemo radiation. Okay. So thank you. Very for, a, for a T1, T2 tumor, it's not offered routinely. No, because you said uh, we choose um, uh, surgery as a primary modality uh, or contact yes. radiation. Yeah, no, no, this, I think yes, I was not, may, maybe I should make it slightly clear. For example, so the dichotomy comes when, so if, if there is a T1 uh, mid-rectal, posterior, temsible, rectal, biopsy-proven, moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma, our unit will do TEMS first, full thickness excision. So, and because we are confident that we can give an all zero resection there. If the patient goes to Bradford, they will have short course radiotherapy for that patient. For, for that. Not that they, they can't do a R0 TEMS, but that's their practice to give short course radiotherapy followed by TEMS. Uh, will we change? I don't know. It's, it's just, it, it's good to have some variety. Right. We are not against, the, against radiotherapy at all. Okay, because I was mentioning about the Haber gamma. Like, would you? Oh, all right. So Haber gamma. So that's a good. Uh, that's a good point you brought, which uh, I didn't touch in my um, okay. in my talk. But one in thirty patients who have radiotherapy, we don't give radiotherapy as primary modality of treatment. Number one, but there are some patients who have radiotherapy for our in our protocol indication. So it's T3, N2, it's close to the CRM. It's, uh, so the, the local recurrence rate is lower if they have long course chemo radiotherapy. So in our practice, around 5% of those give, have complete radiological response. So I had one patient that's, in fact, I'm working on one patient now. He has complete radi ra radiological response. In fact, he was 140 kilograms. So I've asked my upper GI colleagues to do a, a sleeve gastrectomy. So he had a sleeve gastrectomy. He lost weight. He then went on to have short course radiotherapy. He didn't have long course, short course. So 25 gray, five days blast. And then long weight. Previously, we didn't wait long, but now because of COVID, the long weight is uh, becoming a habit. So in the long wait two months, he has shown a radiological complete response. So I scoped in myself last week. I can see the scar and the telangiectasia around the scar. And I've taken biopsies and mapped it. And we will be discussing in our, uh, the histology in our unit to check whether it's safe to wait and watch. So we are flexible. So if it's, he, he was delighted when I told him that uh, the, the, it's been a good response. I said, whoa, whoa, wait, you know, don't jump into conclusions. He's happy that he's lost weight and now he's, instead of being round, 
his more normal shape. So uh, he's doing more exercise. He's actually more fitter for the operation now. So if, if depending on the histology, histology may come back as positive. So it may not be, may not be pathological response. So if the histology is negative, we may go into three monthly flexible sigmoroscopy MRI protocol to see how long we can stretch it. Nice. So thank you very much, nice. You are not at all. Go ahead. Uh, go thank ahead. you, sir. Thank you. And now I'll go to the audience here. Uh, Hari, you might be knowing uh, Vail Murugan. Um, yes. One minute. Uh, sir, Mr. Hari Kishan. Hello, hello. It was, a, it, was a, it was a fantastic talk, actually. It's, uh, it was a joy to listen to you. Thank you. And uh, I just, uh, I'm more sort of an upper GI trainee. I did my upper GI HPB in the UK. Uh, but I did my colorectal initially. I was with Mike Hirschman in Liverpool at Master Unit. I was working as a senior SHO with Mike Hirschman 22 he years ago. He was the god of Thames. Yes, temps. We used to do almost about five to seven temps a week, actually. And I used to be assisting him. He used to talk about a lot about booze and all, actually. <laughs> but I was a senior researcher at that time. Uh, but I'm glad that the temps is still carrying on. Um, uh, the, the Regarding the measurement, what I do here in India, the, the practice is different in India. I've seen both sides of the coin. The problem is the economy and the follow-up is very difficult. This uh, CCR, the complete clinical response thing, uh, even doing a single MRI is difficult in India <laughs> uh, to convince them to get an MRI. Uh, doing a three month follow up and getting an MRI and getting an every scopy is very, very difficult. It's completely different world here. Uh, anyway, the, regarding the measurement, uh, simple thing, rigid sigmatoscopy. I don't see much rigid sigmatoscopy in, in, in Southern India very much in many units, they don't have it. Even though I do have it, calls those uh, rigid sigmatoscopy. But the simple measurement, what we use is, sir, as SAS told us, Dr. Bose uh, told us, digital electrical examination and taking it out and just putting it against the scale, simple scale, that will tell us the, uh, the, the length. Uh, just in, in Sheffield, uh, if somebody comes, if somebody is fit and, and somebody comes with the T2 lesion uh, and not, what would you offer? Would you? offer uh, TEMS or would you offer radical resection or leave it to the patient? So mid, mid rectal, what height? Uh, mid rectal or low rectal? Uh, mid rectal, I would say. Mid rectal T2. T2 uh, N0 on MRI in US. T2 N0 MRI. And it's a fit patient, you know, 50 year old, 60 year old. Would you give them the option of radical resection or TEMS or would you? We would, we would give an option of both. Both, so right. It's both. Because of the duty of candor protocol, I don't know how much you're aware, we need to tell them everything. Right, right. We, we need to tell uh, to the detail and that has to be verbally, you know, what do you say verbally has to be recorded in writing. Right. So so the, the, the if it's, I, you, I would say then that I can do TEMS or radical resection. The recurrence rate with TEMS is so much. This is a side effect and this is the risk and this is the benefit. Uh, the, uh, at the same time, I can do a laparoscopic or robotic low enter resection without, without a loop ileostomy. And this is our unit practice. This is a success rate. This is our leak rate. This is our uh, um, long-term follow-up rate. And you can equally choose between the two. Most of them, most of them would want to try attempts to see whether they can get away with it. Right, okay. And then on the option of having a completion later on, that's how the, you know, I mentioned a high BMI chap with low rectal tumor came back as R1. Right. He didn't want to have an APER and he's traveled 100 miles because he wants transcendental accession. Others have declined. Right. So, but we didn't, we, he wasn't told that this is the next best thing after sliced bread. Mm -hmm. He was told that we can give it a shot, but there is a there is a twenty percent chance that there may be residual tumor or invasion, and if it's the case, you'll need an abdominal perineal resection explicitly mentioned. Right. So unfortunately, he did have R one. The R one is not because of positivity; 
because the margin was less than one millimeter on the scale. Right. So that is taken as an O1. Right. So I rang him last week and said, uh, uh, sorry, buddy, it's R1. So in keeping with our plan, we recommend an APER. Whether he wants it or not is his decision. He can wait and watch and still choose endoscopic surveillance. Then I would tell him there's a 30% chance of uh, local regional re re uh, recurrence and less than 5% chance of distant recurrence. That's the published literature. So, uh, and then he chose, he's chosen an APAR, but there's no urgency to do it. He's going to Barbados for two weeks and then he'll come back and get it on the end of April or in May. Thank you. Regarding the comparison with the Bradford protocol of short course radiotherapy followed by TEMS, is there much difference in the outcome uh, with uh, with uh, pre TEMS short course radiotherapy? Similar. Similar. In in their own series, they have uh, around hundred. Uh, it was published in twenty twenty one. One of my registrars did it, and I know the Bradford surgeons, and we work quite closely. And uh, it's in our patch. I'm the program director. We send all the uh, all the registrars there. So the um, in the 100 patients, 44 had, uh, I think 44 or 45 had short course radiotherapy and the others didn't. Right. And the results are similar. Similar, okay, okay. But the only thing is the, the, the radiotoxicity of short course is, uh, is, is what, what will determine the long-term quality of life for that group of patients. So the quality of life assessment using the quality of life tools, I don't think was done. Okay. Uh, so, but the clinical outcome is similar. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hari, probably we'll close with one final question because it's almost 10 o'clock. Do you, how often do you do a CEA and how do you monitor, do you believe in CEA? Uh, Yes. So the simple answer is yes. So as I, we use it as a prognostic index. So if the tumor is CEA secreting, then we use the CEA to monitor. So if it's if it's not CEA secreting, so if there's a big tumor, if it's not secreting CEA, if the CEA is normal, then it's a waste. So there's no point. Even if the patient can have multi-organ recurrence with the normal CEA. But there are some CEA, around 60% of CEA secreting tumors. So they'll have a very high CEA after the resection or treatment, it goes down. So if they are CEA secreting in responders, then that those group of patients, we do the CEA to measure their, uh, what to say, surveillance. The first year is every three months, second year, six months, and then yearly after that for five years. Sir, I am a urologist. I'm not doing any collateral, collateral surgery, but uh, occasionally we used to use uh, anal rectal mucosa for urethral reconstruction. Mm. Generally, we use buccal mucosa. In rare occasions, we used to take anal mucosa for urethral reconstruction. We used to take two into 10 centimeter maximum with, and after harvesting, we just leave the space as raw area. We don't close actually. Where what we are doing is correct or not, I don't just, I want your, whether these patients, if we close, they go for structure or if we leave, leave as such, it's okay. Because our volume is very less. I've done 10 cases only in the past 10 years because the indication is very limited. So can you give your opinion on if, this? If the, so it's anal mucosa, not rectum. Sometimes rectum also. Because if we leave, need a lengthy mucosa, we go up. Okay. So the length of the... I mean, there are so many uh, surgical gastroenterologists in the, in the audience and in the panel that... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm probably the least experienced of you all, but in general, if the longitudinal, if it's a longitudinal flap, it shouldn't affect uh, long-term healing and stricture. So if circumferentially, if you go then more than one quadrant, then technically it, it, can, it can heal with the stricture. So when we do the advancement flaps, anal advancement flap and rectal advancement flaps for Recto uh, vaginal fistula, uh, recto urethral fistula. So the thing we detach and we put things inside and raise flaps. If it, if the diameter of the, of the flap or raw area is more than one quadrant, 
higher chance of stricture. Healing with the stricture. Longitudinally, you can take whatever length you want. One centimeter long length is not going to affect. Hari, that's uh, any more questions? That's a wonderful uh, lecture, Hari. I think. Uh, Thank you very much. Sum up. Uh, in uh, as you said, uh, Tamis and uh, the EMR ESD in our uh, unit, we used to do EMR and ESD. But uh, you know, as uh, Vale said, uh, the chances of we seeing early lesions like in UK, it's not as high because the colonoscopic surveillance itself is not a factor here because we don't do surveillance colonoscopy at all. Only when a patient has symptoms, you do a colonoscopy. In that case, we pick up lesions which are polyps there. These polyps, we take, as you, should, you said, mm -hmm. uh, from the top, we take a biopsy. If the polyp is small, we do an ESD. If the polyp has been big, we in our unit practice TAMIS because TAMIS is the cheapest thing which can do because we yeah. started TAMIS probably... 10, 12 years before when uh, gel port and uh, the uh, sills port came. Because mm -hmm. it's easy to do a TAMIS. To buy all this uh, TEMS equipment again more expensive than buying a laparoscope. So this is, I think, uh, as a beginner, TAMIS is one of the easiest procedures that can be done if you're already versatile with your laparoscopy. And if the lesion is small, as you said, that also can be done. And uh, to wind up, uh, I think, uh, again, uh, uh, I would say thank you from uh, Trichy for uh, giving this wonderful lecture. And uh, to the last uh, thing, before we conclude, I request our uh, chairman of the Tamil Nadu ASI, Dr. Selvaraj from Tirupur for joining us and uh, a short uh, uh, lecture before we wind up. Thank you, sir, for joining today. I think you'll have to unmute before you talk, sir. Thank you, Gojira, for a lovely session. That was uh, a very innovative one, and you told me about the, I mean, this uh, need a couple of days back, no? I'm sorry I was a bit late. I was held up to some other work. Uh, lovely session. Thank you. And thanks to uh, the ASA Trichy. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Hari for uh, immediately accepting and uh, joining us uh, to enlighten us on this talk. And I would like to thank uh, G. Vishwanathan Hospital and CBCC Cancer Center for hosting the uh, event as part of ASI Trichy, uh, uh, along with uh, the Surgical uh, and the Medical Gastro Society of uh, Trichy. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all senior and junior colleagues for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let's have uh, dinner. Most welcome. And enjoy your dinner. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you, very thank, much. You, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Bose, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Zilbrat, sir. Thank you, 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 sir.